Okay, I see that we are live streaming. Are we good to go, Rob? It'll just be one moment for it to catch up on there. Of course, website. yeah. Let me know. All right, Mr. Warden, we're good to go. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. It's uh, February 10th, 2022, and this is a meeting of Great County <clears throat> Council. I call the meeting to order. And Madam Deputy Clerk, roll call, please. Thank you, Mr. Warden. And we do have all members of council here except for Councillor Clumpus, and she will be joining us shortly. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll turn next to our land acknowledgement. Uh, we acknowledge with respect the history, spirituality, and culture of the Anishinaabek, the Six Nations of the Grand River, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat, Wyandot, Wyandot peoples on whose traditional territories we gather and whose ancestors signed treaties with our ancestors. ancestors. We recognize also the Métis and the Inuit whose ancestors shine, uh, shared this land and these waters, may we all as treaty people live with respect on this land and live in peace and friendship with all of its diverse peoples. Screen here and next uh, declaration of interest. Is there any interest to be declared pecuniary or otherwise? So no hands, we will proceed. And I would just say that the form does come up during the course of the meeting. I would ask you to declare it at that time. We have some sirens going off in Hanover. Uh, so you'll put up with the, <laughs> the noise in the background. Okay, uh, we, item number five, we're going to be adopting uh, minutes. So first of all, uh, County Council and Committee of the Whole minutes dated January 27th and Committee of the Whole budget meeting uh, minutes dated January 28th, 2022. Uh, that is moved by Councillor Robinson and seconded by Councillor Bordignon. Any discussion, uh, Councillor Sowever? Yes, um, with regard to the um, Committee of the Whole Budget Meeting minute uh, resolutions from January 28th, in the budget on their supplementaries, it was recorded that um, 1.184 is the projection from 2022. I've since confirmed with our treasurer here that Blue Mountain's share of that projected based on our budget would be about 930,000 or about 88%. Now, we all know that 88% of the growth doesn't happen in the Blue Mountains. So I am concerned that, you know, that number needs a little bit more investigation, but um, it's not critical. But I just like to point that out that um, I'm also advised that there was no consultation with the lower our lower tier anyway on what our projection was, because certainly should our projection of uh, supplementary be uh, 930, then obviously the 1.184 for countywide, you know, is is probably an underestimation, and I believe also looking at um, you know, just the data from the first year of COVID that um, probably MPAC is behind in a lot of municipalities. So um, I do believe that, um, you know, there is room that that number may be a little bit pessimistic. Thank you, Councillor Sowever. Madam CAO or Mary Dew, is there anything that you folks want to add to that? Let's see. I'm, I'm hoping that at Mary Lou, are you able to comment about our process and the, and the numbers that we use? Yes, I am. So through you, Mr. Warden. Uh, the number for the 1,184,000 comes directly from MPAC and that has been confirmed by our tax consultant, MTE. Um, what each individual local municipality uh, budgets for supplementary taxation is, um, based on their best estimates. So we are using the information directly from MPAC and that's been our process. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Council Soever. Is there anyone else with a comment? If not, then I will call the question. Is there anyone opposed to approval? 
and no hand showing. I'll say that that is carried unanimously. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Let's return to item number six, uh, bylaw. And this is a bylaw to adopt estimates of the revenues and expenditures for the year 2022. It is moved by Councillor Mill and seconded by Councillor Mackey. Any discussion? Seeing none, I will call the question. Is there anyone opposed? If there be no hands, I will say that that also is approved. Item number seven now, uh, good news and celebrations. Councillor Hutchinson. Thank you, uh, Warden, and good morning, uh, Council. I just want to do a shout out and congratulate uh, Councillor uh, Keaveney on her appointment to uh, the 2022 County Economic Development. Um, it was uh, the position was acclaimed and we're all looking forward to working with uh, Shirley moving ahead. Thank you. Yes, thank you for that. And congratulations to you as well in being uh, elected uh, vice chair. Councillor Sowever. Yes, thank, thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, so the, the good news from the Blue Mountains, and I'm sure maybe you've seen it already, most of you, is that the Ministry of Long-Term Care has um, provisionally provided us with an allocation of 160 beds. Um, and those were allocated to the town for inclusion in an RFP, RFQ process that we are uh, proceeding with uh, very shortly. Um, we've also hired a development manager and the hope is that um, we've already had people calling with expressions of interest because now that we have the beds and the land, um, we are looking for private sector partners to develop a long-term care home here in Eastern Gray County to serve the population, not only of Blue Mountains, but also Gray Highlands. Um, so, um, and Meaford. Meaford, obviously, they, they got some new beds recently. So I think this will go a long way to serving the uh, people of this area. Um, population projections indicate that, and these were 2019 projections, uh, indicate that we're going to have over 8,000 seniors over the age of uh, 75 in, in within 30 minute drive of uh, Thornbury. So, um, you know, it's a very badly needed service. The other good news, well, I don't know if it's good news or not, but the Blue Mountains uh, for municipalities over a population of 5,000, we were the second fastest growing municipality in Canada um, with a growth of over 33% since 2016 in terms of population. So, um, you know, it's, it's news. I, people will have a different opinion whether that's good news or, or not so good news. Uh, it certainly poses a lot of challenges and, um, you know, but, you know, it, it is a lot of growth. So that's all I have. Thank you, Councillor Soever. On that long-term care uh, project, it's certainly unique. Are there other examples of that kind of uh, partnership? Uh, no, uh, it took a little bit of work to convince the ministry to do something that they don't normally do, which is allocating beds to a municipality. But we were able to uh, show them that we had a plan and, and we were willing to commit land. And um, they, so this is a new and innovative process, um, but I think it will have the best outcome because as well as long-term care, we're asking proponents to provide attainable housing for the staff. Because as we know, um, you know, in, in this area, house prices have soared. And, you know, if you're going to create, uh, that'll be an, an extra 100 beds to what is already at Erring Run. Um, and um, so there's going to be a need for another 100 to 160 employees. Um, so where will they live? And we all know that staffing was a big challenge for long-term care homes during the last pandemic. And by having the attainable housing on the same site, um, I think that will provide a, a much better outcome for our seniors. Very good. Thank you for that, Councillor Sliver. Certainly um, a feather in the cap for the town of the mountains. Councillor Keaveney, you're next. Thank you very much, Mr. Warden, and good morning, everyone. And I just wanted to thank Councillor Hutchison for his kind words and to share that uh, that uh, Councillor Hutchison has been uh, uh, nominated and uh, voted in as uh, Vice Chair for Economic Development. So I look forward very much to working with you, Tom, and to share 
after uh, Councillor Swever's comments that uh, affordable housing was the main topic of conversation at our Economic Development Committee yesterday. So I would encourage anyone to uh, listen in or check those minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Keaveny. Is there anyone else? Well, certainly not that there was a, a good announcement uh, about uh, additional beds in the town of Hanover as well for long-term uh, care. And just yesterday, there was some uh, good news as well. Is that, that why you have your hand up, Madam CAO? It is. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, I just wanted to advise council in case you hadn't seen the, the media release from um, um, MPP Walker's office that um, the province has invested a, a further of uh, $4 million into uh, Georgian College in support of uh, the new BSCN program. So I think that was uh, really welcome um, by the college and uh, will certainly help them to continue with their plans for the, the renov renovation and um, uh, equipping of the, the new classrooms there for that program. So really exciting and welcome news from the province in that respect. For sure. Okay, I don't see any other hands, so we will then uh, move on. Item number eight is adjournment. It's been moved by Councillor Mill and seconded by Councillor Body that we adjourn. Is there anyone opposed to that? Seeing no one, we are now adjourned. We'll take a second to just switch over to maybe the whole. Okay, so hopefully we're all ready to go. I'll call this meeting to order. We're now meeting as Committee of the Whole and it's February 10th, 2022. Uh, is there any declaration of interest, pecuniary or otherwise? <clears throat> Seeing none, once again, I would say if one does come up during the course of the meeting, you are certainly able to declare it at that time. Item number three is a delegation. Um, hopefully our delegate is uh, present. It's uh, Paul now. Sorry, Mr. Warden, our delegation is um, scheduled for 1045 and we do have Jill Ombach who will be joining us at that time as well. So Excellent. if I could suggest maybe start with the reports and we can go back to the delegation. Excellent, okay, thank you. <clears throat> we'll turn next, I guess, to item 4A, uh, which is the University of Guelph Students uh, Project. Uh, I believe that that's gonna be introduced by Scott uh, Taylor but it's being moved by Councillor Carlton and seconded by Councillor Keaveny. Scott, are you gonna do the introduction? Yeah, thanks Warden Hicks and, and uh, good morning Warden and, and members of council and, and anyone tuning in today. So I'm here with my colleague, uh, Linda Swanson today, just to give uh, council a, a preview of two exciting new projects that we're partnering with the University of Guelph students on. Uh, so I'll be speaking to uh, one project which involves a, a guide around density and Linda will be speaking to a project which involves uh, a guide around um, uh, green development standards. So in, in this case, the, the, the county is partnering with these uh, two teams of University of Guelph students. And, and as council may be aware, we've done this on a number of occasions, uh, both with uh, the University of Guelph, the University of Toronto, and uh, the University of Waterloo. And, and it's a fantastic opportunity for, for the students to get uh, um, some quasi real world planning experience, uh, but also meet the requirements of, of their Masters of Planning project. And, and certainly as a county, we are so thankful for, for the efforts and the research they provide uh, to the county. And, and we've had numerous examples in the past of, of fantastic work that they've done. I should clarify that this work is being done at no cost to the county. Uh, similar projects would, would range if we were to go to a consultant between $25,000 and $35,000. So this is really a wonderful opportunity for the county. Uh, so with that being said, I'll, I'll speak to the first project. And the first project we've, we've uh, mm -hmm. affectionately titled is the density is not a dirty word guide. And in this case, we've got a team of, of four students, Andrea, Maria, Christina, Shivani, and Abigail, who are working on this project. And, and they're exploring both the benefits and the necessity of density in our communities. And when I say density, I'm speaking specifically to residential density. And certainly the timing of this report could not be any better uh, because, you know, as, as most of council will be aware, uh, the province released their report on, on uh, affordability from the task force earlier this week. And, and one of the, uh, uh, the recommendations that was, was first and foremost was the requirement for greater density. And, and, uh, and it's, it's, it's not an option anymore. It's, it's simply a need. And, and what we want to accomplish through this guide is, is a bit of an educational piece 
um, to explain to uh, people in our communities uh, about the both benefits of density, and some of those benefits might come from an affordability perspective or a walkability perspective, um, but also the necessity of, of, of density. And again, that relates back to affordability, but it also relates back to the, the efficient use of land and infrastructure. And, and, you know, we've had these conversations within our communities a number of times, and, and certainly with some of the, the um, larger planning applications we're seeing across the county, uh, I would say we're seeing more and more trepidation uh, from neighbors and people in our community than ever before um, with respect to, to the size and, and density of some of these developments. And so we really see this guide as, as an educational piece that could be used as, as an entire guide, um, but also that we're hoping the students can develop some, some infographics and some short pieces that we can pull out from this guide and, and help provide that, uh, that educational benefit to our residents and, and hopefully uh, take away some of the fears that might be associated with some of these future developments. Uh, one of the things that we, we see them doing here is, is researching other municipal approaches. And what we've been very clear on with the students is that the municipal approaches need to be fairly broad in their perspective um, because a, a new development on full municipal services uh, will look different than a development in, in one of our communities or, or, or one of our towns or villages that doesn't have full municipal services. So it needs to consider a wide range of density there. Um, and and um, it needs to look at things from, from both a planning perspective, uh, but also from an asset management and municipal finance perspective. Uh, so the students are, are on target to complete this work in early April, and it's our hope subject to council's timeframes and, and the students' own timeframes uh, that we can have them back around that time to present their findings to council in this regard after they've had a chance to, to chat with, uh, with uh, people throughout our community and, and dig into this topic further. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to Linda and she can take you through the green development standards. And good morning, Warden and Council. Um, so certainly there are some strong connections between the work of the density students and those who have uh, volunteered to support our work around ex exploring green development standards. So as Council would be aware, uh, the county's cli draft climate change action plan is nearing completion. Uh, and within that draft is the proposal to explore what a green development standard could look like uh, across Gray County. And so what the students are supporting us with, uh, similar to the density project, is a jurisdictional scan of what other communities with similar governance structures and climates uh, and development patterns uh, have, have implemented in regards to supporting green development uh, and paying particular attention around the governance and implementation. There are a number of existing uh, green performance standards available for new construction. Uh, that have been, you know, our technical standards, which support making sure the buildings we build are, are good for the environment in the long term. And so what we've asked the students to do is scan those existing standards and think about them in the context of Gray County. And then specifically given our two tier structure, again, scan other jurisdictions and also provide advice to us around what an appropriate implementation mechanism might be where the county is able to work with our member municipalities. And so one of the things that we've uh, spoken to the students with is the need to really consult broadly in this process and make sure that whatever is being recommended or explored works across the diversity of our member municipalities and really can become the foundation, as Scott mentioned, for uh, an RFP going forward to, to flesh out the project fully. But we're really excited, as Scott said, to have this initial support from the master's students and are confident that they'll give us a good foundation um, around what green development standards might look like here to move forward from. And I think with that, we're probably happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Scott and Linda. Council, are there any questions? I do not see uh, hands. So with that said, it's perhaps. Uh, I think uh, Councillor Milne and Councillor Robinson, as well as Councillor Bourdieu, have. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm on my screen too. My apologies, folks. <laughs> I was looking at screen number two. So, in order, I see Councillor Milne. My apologies. Thank you, Mr. Warden. And uh, just a couple questions. Uh, the first one uh, regarding the uh, the density project. I'm wondering, Scott, is there any indication that the students uh, 
might be having a look at the European experience. Um, they've been dealing with density for probably a few hundred years now, and I expect there's some lessons to be learned there. Um, and the other question was for uh, Linda regarding the uh, green development standards. And I'm wondering how that would relate or how they may relate to the building code, because ultimately that's what most developers will build to is the building code standards. Um, anything else is probably um, nice to have, but push come to shove the building standards rule. So those are my two questions, please. Thank you. Uh, through you, Mr. Warden, maybe I'll go first with the, the density one. Uh, great suggestion, Councillor Milne. Uh, we've asked them to take a, a, uh, a look at a broad range of examples from other jurisdictions. We tend to often focus on, on uh, Ontario and, and we often try to explain to them, you know, it'd be great if you could focus on communities of a similar size to ours. And, you know, as much as Toronto may have great examples on how to deal with density, they're looking at very different numbers than we are. Um, but I, I think it's a good suggestion and we can certainly um, ask them to look a little further afield here. And, and if there's any uh, like communities uh, internationally, um, then maybe it'd be great to learn from those that have uh, many more years of history than we do in that regard. So thank you for that suggestion. And through the warden with regards to the relationship between a green development standard to potential green development standard and the building code. Uh, of course, as you as you rightly note, the building code is the uh, the baseline and the the authority around what's required. What some other jurisdictions are looking at are various programs to incent uh, and at times require um, in consultation with the development community a higher standard. Um, with the anticipation knowing from the federal and provincial levels of government that the building code will likely be changing in the coming years. And so sometimes it's possible for lower tier jurisdictions to kind of lay out a roadmap so that our developers here are, are ready for those changing codes as they come down. Well, thank you for those answers. And I really appreciate the input or, or the thoughts. Uh, but I, I wish you well with the building code changes because you know, the industry has been demanding or most municipalities have been looking for changes in something as simple as adding hurricane clips and the building code just resists like crazy. And so any, any other changes to uh, green standards, I look forward to, but uh, there'll be, uh, anyway, good luck. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, sir. I just want to say good morning and welcome to Councillor Tumpus. Uh, we're dealing with item 4A on the agenda. Um, we have not yet had the, uh, the delegation on poverty task uh, from the poverty task force. We'll be getting to that uh, after. Uh, Councillor Robinson, you are next. Thank you very much and through you, uh, Mr. Ward, and good morning to one and all. You know, I really like the connection between uh, the green development standards and density. And I also really uh, applaud the fact that we have university students studying and researching uh, this very topic. Along with that, uh, I'm wondering, Scott and Linda, are you able to comment in terms of our youth stakeholders? And will, will there be an opportunity for uh, youth in our community, our Greek, our Greek County community, to be able to comment on, uh, on this project? After all, future leaders, uh, future individuals that will be purchasing homes and, um, you know, growing their family in Gray County. Look forward to your comments. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Warden, I can I can take a start at this, and, and Linda, certainly if you have any further comments. Um, in this case, the students are on a rather condensed time frame, and, and uh, we've designed these projects to be uh, in this case, remote, just based on not knowing how the public health and COVID um, um, changes could happen throughout their, their semester, so to speak. And, and so what we've done in this case is to identify a list of stakeholders for each project that, that uh, we hope they can try to reach out to virtually, whether through a Zoom or Teams meeting or whether through online surveys or phone interviews of, of, of that nature. Um, I'll be honest with you, we haven't identified youth stakeholders at this stage for either project. Um, it's something we could give more thought to. Uh, some of the challenges with that when we can't meet in person um, is, is, you know, 
how to how to connect to the youth uh, network, short of you know maybe tapping on our own children, but they're probably already biased anyway. Um, you know how to how to how to get in front of that youth audience, so to speak. Um, so certainly, if there's any suggestions, we're open to them. Um, but I will say that the, the scope of these projects um, are fairly tight uh, with respect to um, both projects. I think though this is just sort of an early point in the conversation, you know, as Linda will, will note, there's there's many other steps to come in terms of the implementation of the climate change action plan, where we'd want youth input, and, and certainly future policy changes at the county level with respect to density, um, in terms of official plan amendments or other such documents, I think we could do a, a more robust consultation in that regard as well. Thank you. Next is uh, Councillor Bordignon. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Warden, through you. Um, in, in regards to, uh, we assume that this will, um, this report will be a guide. Um, have we looked at, um, through this guide, a report, um, definitions of attainable housing uh, and affordable housing? We know there's a distinct criteria and difference between the two. So I would be hopeful those would be in there because in the provincial policy statement, they're looking at inclusion of, uh, of course, more uh, affordable or, uh, and attainable housing. And that's currently not in the um, the LP, uh, the OP from either county or lower tier municipalities. So I'd be hopeful that we would see that because we know that the province's housing task force is gonna issue the report soon. And that most definitely will be in there. So will this, will the students be taking a look at that from um, that angle, at least definition and putting measurable targets in there? Sure, thank you for that question. And, and through you, Mr. Warden, um, this report in terms of the density report, it's not specifically an affordable housing report, but we definitely see it affordable housing related. And, and so in the, in the current county official plan, uh, there, are there are definitions for affordable housing and we, we have targets in there. Um, but I think what we want to work with the students on um, is, is to explore the, the, the benefits of density uh, to support all types of housing, uh, whether it be affordable or attainable uh, or even market rate housing. Um, you know, one of the, I think, suggestions from the, the provincial report is, is simply that we need more housing. So I think we'll definitely want to raise both affordable and attainable housing uh, with the students and, and give them an understanding of what that might mean in the Grey Conic context, but also in the context of each of the nine member municipalities. Um, but in this particular case, I don't think we're necessarily asking them to add definition to what each of those terms are, knowing that through, through other county programs in terms of things like the official plan and things like our own housing department, um, we will be, you know, fleshing out what each of those terms mean in our context. So I don't know if that answers your question, but certainly happy to expand if it, if it doesn't. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, just to follow up, Mr. Warden. Yeah, it, it, it does. I, I just hopeful as we, as we move forward that they're all going to run in parallel with each other because you're going to see, of course, because we don't see that in the official plan right now uh, at, at any length. And we know that true definitions uh, between the two, and it may be not the genesis of this report, but it's also, it would help to be some targets and definitions uh, laid out there to, to help follow, especially when you're moving into the OP. Um, uh, as we see, you know, it is outlined in the provincial policy statement. So we'd like to, and I, I, again, the, 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 the task force uh, will be coming out with the report soon and, and we're sure to see uh, those two definitions be in there. So I'd, I'd hopeful that we get ahead of the curve on that as well. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bordignon. Councillor Desai, you're next. Thank you, Warden Hicks. Um, my, I got disconnected a little bit, so I, I apologize if some of what I say is a repetition, um, but I heard uh, Councillor Robinson asked about uh, the youth input, and I heard part of uh, Scott's response to that. Um, I think one of the things we need to recognize is youth is, is such a broad term um, and it's, it's not really defined. I mean, for some members of council, someone who's 35 or 40 could be youth. Um, and for some members of council, someone who's 15 to 17 is youth. Um, so I think, I think rather than look at that as a, as a catch-all term, uh, we should look, we should treat it as it is, as, as different demographics really, because um, I know my opinion on some of this, um, or the, the opinion of people born in my generation on some of these things would be distinctly different from people who are in high school today. So uh, a couple of suggestions are what I, uh, that I'd like to make. Youth groups in 
uh, in our in our county. Uh, for example, there is uh, the Rotary Thailanders that deal with uh, young people. There is also the Junior Farmers of Grey County uh, that that uh, have a membership exclusively of, of younger people. Um, there is also organizations in our in our county that uh, cater exclusively to young people. For example, in Flesheton, uh, there is the uh, the Hanley Institute, which is a a lovely um, organization that. Uh, works with um, with youth and after school programs and such, and I, I'm sure there's other organizations and other municipalities that are similar, and um, they could um, they'd be more than happy to sort of set up a workshop of some kind um, where uh, you know um, the county could go in and uh, and organize a workshop or, or work with them to get their input in a, in a more informal, more indirect and perhaps a more interactive way. Thank you, uh, word next. Thank you, Councillor Desai. And I, I did hear Scott say that uh, staff are willing to put their heads towards that. Uh, Councillor Keaveney, you are next. Thank you, Mr. Warden. And a question for Scott and Lyndon. I realize I may be uh, sinking down into the weeds a little bit, but I was curious to know as part of the project, if you'd be asking the students to look at things like uh, Greener building materials, uh, disposal of construction uh, materials, uh, tree preservation, lighting within subdivisions, and that kind of thing, or strictly on the actual building uh, processes themselves. I saw Linda bobbing her head, so maybe Linda is the best person here. Um, thank you, through you, Warden Hicks. Uh, so we've asked them to look primarily I think at what's happening in other jurisdictions. And certainly there are green building materials is part of that conversation. So it's the, the operation of the building and the materials to build. Um, and in terms of the consultation that happened through the fall on the overall climate action plan, uh, there was certainly feedback that as we're looking at uh, green development, we should be looking at things like tree planting and potential uh, green infrastructure uh, on, on development sites. So I would say at a high level, yes, we've not in any way limited the students and have encouraged them to take a kind of broad um, look at sustainable development. To vote, Mr. Warden, yes, thank you very much to you and to Linda. Thank you. Councillor Sauber, you're next. Yes, thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, so I, th I think these are great projects um, and I want to thank the students and the university for, you know, working with us on this. And um, so as far as the density one, which is, um, you know, is, is it going to compare what's actually, uh, are they going to actually be looking at what the density of uh, projects has been over the last, say, few years in various uh, lower tier municipalities and, you know, what the, the rules are around that. And um, so, you know, are we going to get some historical context? Because I would be really interested in, in, in seeing, you know, what, you know, what we have been doing against our targets as well. I mean, the, the county does have targets for attainable and affordable. Um, but, you know, it says the, the provincial policy statement does say implement as well. So, um, you know, I'd like to see, you know, have we been achieving those targets? I mean, it's great to have targets, but it's another thing to actually achieve them. And, and so I'd be very interested in that. I know that's quite a bit of work, but um, we're certainly happy, uh, I'm, well, I'm speaking for staff, but I'm sure our staff would be happy to provide them with those statistics for the Blue Mountains. And hopefully we can, you know, do a countywide survey of uh, what we've been achieving in terms of density and, um, well, the, the county planning department would have that as well. Um, the, the other thing is there's been a lot of, there's 55 recommendations in the new um, housing task force report and um, so there's quite a bit that would concern density. Um, you know, they're, they're limiting ex, um, like recommendation three is to allow as of right residential housing up to four units and up to four stories on a single residential lot. So recognizing that's not yet policy, it's just recommendations from a task force, um, you know, are, are the is the work that's going to be done going to consider some of these recommendations and, and how they might impact Gray County? 
Thank you. Um, Madam CAO, did you want to weigh in on that? Thank you, Mr. Warden. And I want to thank council too for all of your uh, thoughtful uh, uh, suggestions and, and considerations with regard to these reports, especially the one um, dealing with density. Um, I think you're familiar with um, other student projects that we've that we've been able to have done in the past. Um, the thing about these projects is, while we're re we really benefit from um, the expertise of the students and their interest and, and fresh perspective, they are very they're very focused and they're very time limited. Right? This is this is part of the students' work uh, for their program. And so um, the county does need to make some accommodations for what we're asking them to do to ensure that it aligns well with the, the program requirements of their, of their master's program. So what I would suggest is that we'll take back all of your suggestions and, and other questions um, as time moves forward and we see where the province lands with turning these recommendations into um, actual policy. Um, and I think there'll be a lot of follow-on work that, that happens um, later this year. Um, where we can, we'll do our best to address uh, questions that, that you've raised this morning. But as I say, um, the, the scope of work for the, for the projects um, by definition needs to be quite focused. Um, and so that's where we are right now. And we'll, we'll make sure that your questions do get answered in due time. Thanks. Thank you very much, Madam CAO. Um, uh, Council Robinson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Warden, for recognizing me. And just on a thought as uh, uh, Madam CAO was speaking, um, just refresh my memory in terms of the timeline for this project. And will it dovetail perhaps with the AMO conference? And is there an ability, just food for thought at this time, that we may be able to speak with um, Minister uh, Clark in terms of uh, density and uh, the results coming out of the project. Anyway, I just put that on the table for now, but thought it worthwhile. Thank you. Thank you for that. Okay. I think we are ready to call the question, are we? So on the motion before us to receive for information this uh, report, anyone opposed? Seeing no hands, that is indeed carried. I understand that both of our um, delegates are here now, um, both Paul and Jill, and Barb will be making introductions. We're now dealing with item number three, delegation from uh, the Poverty Task Force. Good morning, Mr. Warden, County Council. Um, thank you for the opportunity for our colleagues from the uh, Bruce Gray Poverty Task Force to attend today. This is the culmination of a year's tour to all of your municipalities. We were welcomed uh, to delegate at each and every one of our municipal uh, colleagues uh, as, as an opportunity to share information learned, um, to uh, bring forward some wonderful innovations that have taken place during a very difficult time. Uh, as we know, there are some silver linings in some of the work that's been going on with the pandemic. And today we have um, Paul Wagner, who is the food security coordinator, and Jill Umbach as the planning network coordinator, uh, both working with Poverty Task Force. So I would like to welcome uh, these colleagues of ours and a very strong community partner with the County of Bray. Excellent, thank you very much. I'll just share the screen with everyone and uh, we'll get started. Sure. Good morning and welcome. Thank you. Bear with me for a moment. There we go. All right, can, I hope everyone can see that all right. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. Many of you are familiar with the tool foodbrewsgray.com from our, our presentations over the past six months. Today, what we'd like to do is update you on the food insecurity situation in our region using data from that tool. As always, our immediate goal is to build awareness of food insecurity through informing, educating, and correcting misconceptions while demonstrating the size and scope of the issue in our communities. Our longer term goal is to continue to connect more people, agencies, and food organizations to engage in creating solutions to the underlying causes while continuing to provide those in need with the solutions or as until those solutions become available. 
One in five people in Gray Bruce is suffering from some form of food insecurity right now. Seniors, adults, children, food insecurity doesn't discriminate. Food banks and meal programs are doing a good job alleviating food insecurity, much the same way that Band-Aids work. The work being done by those organizations and volunteers is vitally important because the demand has never been greater. But as agencies, organizations, and governments, it's important for us to recognize that until we take steps to address the root, root causes of food insecurity, all we're really doing is treading water. With rising housing costs and increasingly greater proportion of household income having, uh, and also having inflation for the first time in a generation, the threat of rising interest rates, all of these issues are combining to make food insecurity, the food insecurity issue worse in our region. Working towards finding solutions, there are challenges to be overcome for sure. A general lack of overall awareness that people have about the size and scope of this problem, the importance and need to cross connect food organizations, leaders and volunteers to community agencies so that via collaboration, they're able to make warm referrals for meeting their clients' needs and fostering an increased connectivity between the different community organizations such as food banks and meal programs and gardens and food rescue organizations. And also finding ways to overcome distance and geography and weather to move and share food between the 50 plus organizations over the 8,000 square kilometers in an efficient and timely manner. Whoops, sorry. Uh, we'd like to review some of the things that are, are, are working to help the situation. The first of this is the Poverty Task Force. And we'll let Jill address this, this one. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, as you are aware, it's almost close to 10 years that uh, Gray County has supported the Poverty Task Force, and we are really grateful for that continued support and the leadership um, that has been taken by this council um, on working on anti-poverty um, reduction um, issues. Um, the Poverty Task Force currently still works with over 52 community-based organizations. In this past year, we've been heavily involved with connecting with the Community Safety Wellbeing Plan, with Community Drug and Alcohol Strategy, with the Healthy Communities Partnership Table as well, to look at the impact of what's going on in our communities. Uh, the work that Paul is doing is supported by our community of practice of food, uh, community food programs. So um, our work, a lot of what we're doing is providing the backbone support and the ongoing connectivity between research, data collection and action on the ground. And um, Paul's gonna speak more to that. One of the things that's also working are the uh, food security meetings. They're a way to facilitate grassroots conversations between the volunteer organizations, governmental agencies, and community partners to discuss shared issues, challenges, and solutions. Designed to enhance connectivity and collaboration, these one-hour bi-weekly meetings tackle diverse topics from everything from period poverty to how, how to address legal advice for clients of the food banks and the meal programs. The website foodthoughts.ca was designed to fill a gap of accessible training and information for the community food organizations. Many volunteers are pressed for time and unable to attend in person or go to even online meetings. So they wanted a resource tool that they could view when they had time. With more than 250 articles and videos on food bank, meal program, and community garden issues, this tool is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and is growing every week. We have appreciated the support that all of your councils have provided to foodbrewsgray.com. And it's as it provides accessible and up-to-date information for, the, for food insecurity in Gray Bruce. With more than 85% participation from the community food organizations, for the first time, community leaders, the media and the public have a tool that enables conversations from, from being based only on anecdotal information to having evidence-based conversations. We'd like to share some of that data comparing 2021 to 2020. The community meal programs provided more than 180,000 meals in 2021, which was a 31% increase. And that's, con that's continuing the 300% increase from pre-COVID levels. Food rescue programs diverted 74,000 kilograms worth of food, an 82% increase over the previous year. To put that in terms of you know, grocery bags, an average uh, grocery bag weighs 35 pounds. That would, the food uh, rescue program would have diverted 46,000, sorry, 4,600 4, bags of groceries. 
Uh, the food bank programs distributed 171,000 kilograms worth of food, a 27% increase over the previous year, or the equivalent of more than 10,700 bags of groceries. The food bank programs uh, served 21,442 clients, a 10% increase over the previous year. Not only do many of the 22 food banks in Gray Bruce provide food support, but they also provide food insecure and vulnerable people uh, income support uh, solutions through tax clinics and warm referrals to other programs. The community gardens grew 18,000 kilograms worth of fresh produce last year. And they're scattered throughout Gray Bruce. Many, many gardens were not able to operate in 2020. With protocols in place in 2021, these gardens were able to make a significant contribution to food banks and meal programs, providing fresh fruits and vegetables. Last year, volunteers donated more than 36,000 hours, which is a 60% increase over the previous year. Using data from volunteer.ca, that would represent more than a million dollars worth of payroll. Not only does foodbrucegray.com draw attention to food insecurity, it also exists to help inform everyone about the tremendous commitment that the volunteers have made to helping address this issue. In the coming months of 2022, we hope to expand food rescue programs to more grocery stores, restaurants, and businesses, as well as more communities in Gray and Bruce. We want to reach out to more gardens to become part of the Gray Bruce Community Garden Network, and we want to help develop even more gardens on top of that. We want to continue to enhance awareness and interconnectivity between all of the different food organizations. As issues and solutions are discussed, we're constantly remember, reminded to ensure that we appreciate the biases and stigmas that we all have. We need to engage more decision makers and people to, in conversations to help address the need to increase the supply of safe and affordable housing. And then not to forget that the people experiencing food insecurity deserve our respect and their dignity. How can you help? By continuing to do what you've been doing helping to facilitate more evidence-based solutions, like more safe and affordable housing. You've already provided tremendous leadership and by encouraging even more mixed property development, this has really helped to move the conversation beyond simply donating food to actually influencing one of the root causes of poverty. By supporting and recognizing income solutions from organizations that pay a living wage and more community members are benefiting from the reduction in poverty. And finally, to explore how a basic minimum wage can work to encourage more open conversations and help some of the, overcome some of the historical misconceptions that that topic has. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. Um, and on behalf of Jill and Barb, and to, we appreciate your support in helping to illuminate this large but mostly hidden issue. We've covered a lot of information very quickly. And if you have any questions, we would be more than happy to answer them for you. Well, thank you very much, Paul. And thank you very much, uh, Jill. I know the pans are uh, going up already, so we'll get straight to them. Councillor Mellon. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, question for the, uh, the, the two, two guests today is, what is um, a current living wage in Gray, Bruce? Would you like to address current. that, Jill? I can do that, Certainly. yes. <clears throat> so uh, traditionally, annually, the uh, United Way um, calculates the living wage. Um, the last living wage we had done was in 2019 using 2018 data, which was 1839. Um, since then, we have not issued a new one because there is a little bit of a debate as to what should be included and not included in that calculation based on the, the current pandemic conditions. We're estimating around $22 an hour right now with the increase in the cost of living. Um, and the increase of cost of fuel. We haven't released it for this year because things are shifting. Um, but Brian, um, Councillor Brian, I would say it's around $22 an hour. Right Suffice now to say the 15 is not enough. Yeah, and what, one of the factors you will see from um, Living Wage Ontario releases what other communities are doing. So other cities and municipalities have actually seen with the introduction of the CERB last year, a reduction in the living wage. And we felt that that here in Grey Bruce, that was a bit of a misleader on the actual uh, requirement. So while the government uh, supplemented people last year, they're not seeing necessarily the large supplements this year. 
So we didn't want to release something that went below the 1839, which we felt was still not going to give a true picture of the cost of living as we know, which is going up. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Robinson, you're next. Thank you very much. I'm just going to take my electronic hand down. Um, you know what? I very, very much appreciate this uh, conversation. And thank you, uh, Jill and, and Paul, for being here. Inspiring. Um, there is a call to action. Um, so I really, really appreciate that. And two questions, if I might. If you could just um, further explain how we can explore a guaranteed basic income and how that can work. And I appreciate uh, Councillor Milne um, addressing the um, living wage issue. And also on a second point, how can a local community garden become connected with uh, Grey Bruce Community Network? Thank you and appreciate the uh, presentation. Right, uh, Jill, I'll maybe let you address the oh. first one and I'll address yep. the second one. That sounds good. So um, um, the basic income or the guaranteed livable income, right now uh, we do have a private member's bill, which is before parliament and the Senate. Um, and it's put forth to look at what would the framework of that be? So basically come up with the nuts and bolts of how would that work if the, if the federal government decided on um, switching to a, a guaranteed income for all citizens. So right now they do have the setup for seniors. Seniors have a guaranteed income supplement. Um, so the government would be, if the bill was passed, it's just going into second reading. If that private member's bill was passed, they would then have a working group that would develop the framework for a national. Um, so it would, in, in our, my perspective and my experience, um, the recommendations that came out of the pilot in Ontario um, for a basic income, it would work similar to that or maybe not. I mean, it might, uh, <laughs> Barb's going, well, <laughs> there's a lot of discussion on what's the easiest way. We know that the GIS to seniors through the tax system is a very direct way to get additional supports into the income. It's based on your filing your taxes every year um, and it reduces the paperwork and the bureaucracy of applying year after year. Um, so um, there's a lot of models out there, but I think the one being advocated for right now by a various um, a political people at the national level is to discuss what the best one is, come up with a framework and to see how it works through the, the tax system. Arb, I don't know if you've got anything to, in your experience that might add to that. Thanks, Jill. Um, so we've certainly seen um, how people's lives have stabilized with that $2,000 uh, a month uh, from the federal benefits. And as that um, changed at the end of October into November and December, we're seeing our, our caseload climb. Um, there's been some extension of benefits, but we know, um, considering the rates of, for social assistance, um, $800 for a single person versus the $2,000 that was determined at a federal level, um, there's a huge disparity. And it, 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 the reason for all the programs that we're talking about um, are to make up the difference, to help people to meet their basic needs. And so when we think about the infrastructure that goes into creating all of those other programs and supplementing housing and food and medical care and transportation, how much are we really spending um, when it could be a universal basic income that could meet the needs of folks? And it goes back to your social determinants of health. It really does. It drives back to meeting the needs of housing first, then stabilizing for other needs uh, that people may have um, in our vulnerable population. So it's complex. Uh, we call it a wicked problem because it one thing leads to another, but um, chipping away at it is the way to go. Yeah, one of the things that we find in our conversations with the food organizations is most people are spending 80, 90 or 100 percent of their income just to have some place to live. And it's affecting you know, increasingly what used to be deemed the middle class. Uh, so it's not just the people that you would traditionally think would be using a meal program um, or a food bank. To address your second concern, the easiest way for a garden to connect is to send me an email or to call me at the United Way. Um, again, what we're trying to do is build a, a collaborative network where we share ideas, resources, um, and also the food that's generated so that it can go to meal programs or food banks that could really use the, the support. 
Thank you very much. And Paul, your email address is very slowly. Okay, uh, it's uh, food at unitedwaybg.com. Food at unitedwaybg.com. Thank you. Yes. Mr. Warden, can I suggest too that I can be a conduit as well? If folks want to reach out, they can just certainly connect through me and, and I can loop back in with Paul and John. For sure. Okay, next is Councillor Keevan. Mr. Warden, thank you. And uh, my first question has basically been answered by Barb. I was wondering about uh, predictions post pandemic, but we sense that we're going to have an even greater need. So my second question was, uh, and it was mentioned in the presentation that uh, there's a need to grow awareness of this problem. And I'm wondering how we go about that and thinking of uh, home gardeners and you know everybody plants too many cucumbers and tomatoes and potatoes and all the rest of it and how we reach those folks to encourage them to donate their extra produce to food banks to, uh, to support the programs. If, if I could address that, um, I'll maybe back up one step. When you look at the data that's been generated by foodbrewsgray.com, a lot of people anticipated that the demand would start to decline as COVID started to end. And that hasn't been the case. The demand for food banks and for the meal programs has actually been increasing virtually every month. And it's really being driven by the housing situation now much more than, you know, than COVID. Um, so again, that's one of the nice things about this particular tool. You can actually see where the demand is. Um, to address your second point, awareness, you know, that's huge. You know, we've appreciated the opportunity to speak to all of you. Uh, last year, we did 35 presentations to various municipal councils, high schools, colleges, universities, service clubs, and we're doing everything we can to get that message out to people. And, you know, we're certainly open to more ideas, but we're using social media, um, you know, word of mouth and, you know, conversations like the one we're having today to, to reach out to as many people as we can, um, just to really build an awareness of it. When people drive through our towns, they can't believe that there's a food insecurity issue here. You know, it's not something that's even on their radar. But using the stat that we had at the beginning, one in five people in Grey Bruce is experiencing some form of food insecurity. So we need all the help we can get. And we're open to everybody's ideas. Thank you. Are we good to call Council Keegan? Yes, thank you, Mr. Warden. Next is Councillor Desai. Thank you, Warden Hanks. Um, <clears throat> I have three questions here. Um, the first is, do we have if if we have a list somewhere of uh, a list of corporations that uh, do pay a living wage? Uh, I know I've walked into a, a certain service industry or service uh, providers uh, that that do have uh, uh, notices out that they that that advertise that they do pay a living wage. Do we have a list centrally of corporations that do this? Or the second is, do we have organizations in Grey Bruce that are actively uh, lobbying senior levels of government for uh, the provision of a universal basic income. Um, <clears throat> one of the uh, reasons that people take a lower paying job is because something is better than nothing. Uh, and if their basic needs were looked after, they would be able to uh, consider uh, saying, uh, you know, I think my time is worth more than $14, $15 an hour. Um, and the last question I have is if we know whether we know there is a there is a shortage of labor in our in our area in our region. Uh, do we know though if this current shortage of labor in our region has led to corporations having to provide increased remuneration uh, to to attract people, and if that has maybe moved us a little closer from the fifteen to the twenty two? Uh, those are my three questions. Thank you. Word next. Yeah, there's a lot packed in there. Who wants to yeah. start, Bill? <laughs> so I'm going to tackle those questions. So first of all, we do not have currently a list of corporations that do pay a living wage. What we do have is um, we have collaboration between all of the employment agencies um, and four county labor planning market board. Um, and they do research on who is paying what, where, um, where the jobs are, where the demands are. So as you probably have received recently from Gemma Mendez Smith, that type of analysis around precarious living examines, you know, what is part of 
the living wage because there's the living wage plus benefits. There's other precarious aspects of staying employed um, and being able to feed your family. Um, so we know it's living wage is only one component of reducing precarious work. Um, but pre-pandemic, we had planned um, uh, as part of our income and security, uh, employment security action group to track that and to promote those that were, were, were providing a living wage and great conditions and benefits um, and to engage with employers to say a little bit more would go a long way to retaining um, your employees. And that was something we did in partnership with Four County Labor Planning Market Board in 2019. We did a employer one survey and then we did an employees one survey. And they had never done that before to say, well, why are people staying on the job? And some of those aspects you talked about, what keeps people employed? Um, and sometimes it's the wage, but sometimes there's other, other benefits offered. Um, shuttle service to work, other things that address the lack of transportation or uh, subsidies for childcare, big issue. Can you find childcare for women to get back into the workforce? Um, so our income and employment um, action group recently um, uh, met and they were discussing, you know, what is it going to take to get people back in and how do we match people um, to the job? So we know that there's a shortage in skilled labor. We also know there's a shortage in childcare. We also know there's a pandemic and risk for frontline people. So frontline worker can be retail, um, could be somebody working in childcare centers, trying to provide that those services. Um, the employment um, partners that we have have spoken to how they negotiate with, with uh, employers. And they will say, you know what, you're just offering too low or the package isn't good enough. And therefore, so and so other corporation is going to get the employees. So there is a discussion around that happening. Um, I think there is a recognition by the Ontario government that some employers aren't able to meet that living wage standard. Um, and therefore we have precarious employers or precarious um, businesses in place that need to be looked at. If I think of some of the small businesses, uh, retail businesses, not the large ones, but the smaller ones, we're not going to talk. Looks like we have a frozen screen. Paul, are you able to pick up or perhaps Barb? Uh, Barbara, did you want to, to continue that? Sure. I think um, Jill's message was fairly clear that uh, it's it's a big issue, but we do have lobbying as well. We, we know that there have um, passed through here at council last year. I think it was last year in, in July. Um, there was a motion from um, Kitchener, um, the city of Kitchener, to support a universal basic income and council endorsed that and sent a letter um, stating that Gray County supported that motion. Um, and then finally, I think the last question was about um, have, have we seen businesses that have actually uh, addressed this by saying, I guess I'll have to pay more. I know it's coming out of my profits and it's going to be really difficult, but that's the only way to actually attract. We've seen that absolutely, Councillor Desai. Um, we, they're competing with one another and it's really unfortunate because it takes all of us to build that, that structure um, of, of our local business community. Um, but we see signage. I've seen signage where people are saying we, we pay this amount, which is pretty hard for someone who's driving to work past that sign every day to think, well, I could be making that wage. We know in our sector, we've lost uh, childcare workers to factory work because they were paying more at the factory. And yet they're educated and passionate about their about what they chose for a career. It's just, it's bottom line. It's what it takes to survive. So it's that wage. So I hope we answered your questions. Councilor Thank you, Warden. Thank you, Barb. And uh, when Joel gets back, thank you to her as well uh, for the detailed answer. Um, I, I am struggling a little bit because this is not the first time we've uh, we've heard of this issue. This is not the first time we've uh, we're hearing of this. And there's got to be something that, as a level of government, that we can do uh, to work on this. And I'm not saying. That, that we should stop receiving these uh, delegations because I think it's important that we receive these delegations because these are issues that uh, someone we might see at, at in, in our community is perhaps dealing with. 
But there has to be something that as, as a level of government that we're able to do, uh, whether it's through lobbying or, and I, and I just feel at a loss of uh, words, I feel a bit helpless because it seems that there's all these um, problems and they, they, there doesn't seem to be solutions. Um, and, yeah, and, and yeah, so th that was the reason for, especially for, the second question with regards to uh, if there are any organizations that are actively lobbying that we could perhaps support in some way uh, in their in their lobbying efforts and, and so on. Um, but yeah, it's, it's I, 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 I really uh, respect the work and appreciate the work that Barb, Paul and, and Jill do um, because it certainly it can't be easy uh, to, um, to deal with these issues on, on a daily basis. Um, so, uh, yeah, yeah. If there's anything that you know, council can can do. Um, I yeah, I, yeah. Sorry for the rambling. No, it's it's. If I can interject, you know, the work that you've been doing on housing, you know, when you look at the root causes of so many of the problems, people can't afford to live here, and if we can increase the supply of housing, I have a degree in economics, supply and demand, and right now the demand is through the roof. But if we can balance that equation, I think we'll see a lot of the other issues starting to come into play um, and, and find solutions. But the very best thing are, are lots of conversations about what everybody might be able to bring to the table. Great, and Councilor Yusai, uh, I think that slide 12 uh, of the delegation um, is a nice little summary. Three things that I see there, facilitating more affordable housing, supporting and encouraging more organizations to pay a living wage, and lastly, exploring how a guaranteed basic income can work. Um, I think those are the three, three very tangible things that we could turn our heads to, and I suspect that we'll be doing just that. Uh, I see Barb smiling. Uh, Councillor Milne. Thank you, Mr. Warden. <clears throat> and just a comment, uh, I can appreciate Councillor Desai's frustration, but the reality, as far as I can see, the reality is we know what the solutions are, but by and large. As a community, as a society, are we prepared to suck it up and put those solutions in place? We had an opportunity to do a full study and a fulsome opportunity to see the impacts of a guaranteed income. And the current government decided to throw it out the window. And I'm not trying to be political here one way or the other, but I'm just saying as a community, we know what the solutions are. Are we going to grow a set and do the job and, and solve the problem? Well, some passion certainly helps, Councillor Mellon. We know that you are never political. All right. I think we've come to the end of our discussion. I see people smiling. Maybe that's a good place uh, uh, for us to end. I want to thank you, Paul, and thank you, uh, Jill. Very good uh, presentation and very good uh, discussion. Barb, thank you as well. Uh, I think, you know, bottom line, you folks are out there advocating for people to live with dignity. And that's, that's the bottom line. And people are entitled to that, surely. Um, I want to say that I really appreciate the information that comes um, from the Poverty Task Force uh, during the pandemic, um, particularly uh, the data and the sort of, you know, collating of information and uh, where to go for what. Um, that was so useful to see in one place and for us to be able to share. Um, thank you for doing that and continuing uh, to do that. I can't help but think that people who may have been struggling, uh, treading water and trying to keep their nose <laughs> just barely above the water, that for uh, some of them, that was uh, a lifeline indeed. So again, thank you for everything that you do and thank you for being here today and making that uh, presentation. Council, it is now um, just about 10 minutes uh, past. Uh, I'm going to suggest that we take a 15 minute uh, break, which will bring us back uh, here at 1125 sharp. We'll see you then. Please turn off your uh, video and unmute, please.
All right, we are back. We have Rob, are we good to go? Yes, we're ready to go, Mr. Warden. Excellent. Thank you and welcome back, everyone. We are now on to item 4B, which is the response time performance plan results for 2021. That puts Kevin on deck. This item has been moved by Councillor Bordignan and seconded by Councillor Robinson. Kevin, you have the floor. Morning, Council and Warden. Uh, can everybody see my presentation okay? Perfect. Okay, uh, today I'm here to talk to you about the uh, 2021 response time uh, results. Um, so two recommendations. Uh, the first is that to receive the report and also to, uh, to send the correspondence to the ministry by March 31st of this year. At the county, we're continually looking look to improve our service at all times. And one is also where we spend a lot of time is around response times. And you can see that where we meet the, where we set the targets for, especially where we can determine the times, see task two, three, four, and five, we keep to a 90th percentile, which is a nine times out of 10, which at times can be difficult to meet, but we keep it there because it, it does give a true reflection, nine times out of 10, how often we are able to get to a, a destination a certain amount of time. We also look at numerous things. We adjust uh, deployment of vehicles based upon peak call uh, call time frames. We've introduced technology, uh, a CADLink program that gives real time locations of calls and call information as it, as it comes up through our dispatch center. Over the years, we've uh, put in additional staffing and uh, we've, you know, that involved up staffing in Dundalk nights and Craig Leith nights, extra additional coverage in Craig Leith during the ski season months. And then uh, we continue to work with new models of care around programs like first response and community paramedics, uh, where we've tried to decrease the need on the 911 system wherever possible. So it's an ever evolving and constantly uh, monitored and uh, adjusted uh, work that we do to, to maintain and, and, and keep these and improve upon these response times. So this report will give you the 2020 resp response times that we were able to attain. So each year uh, in the summer, I generally bring the report forward in August uh, and we have to determine the next year's plan for the response time of the upcoming calendar year. And then at this time every year, we report on the previous year's performance. And this, this information is fed to the ministry and they do upload it to the uh, Government of Ontario website where you can see all services across Ontario. There are six targets that we look at. The first one is uh, the time it takes to get a defibrillator to the scene of a sudden cardiac arrest. And that's not just paramedics, but it could be a public access DFib site, it could be the fire department, uh, but that time is measured in how often and what percentage can we get there or get a defibrillator to that patient's side within six minutes. The second target is around CTAS ones or our, our most, our sickest patient. And the time that there is set by the ministry of eight minutes and the percentage is set by us is how often we get to those CTAS one patients within eight minutes. And then the CTAS two, three and four and five categories, the municipality sets those times and the percentile uh, for each of those uh, for the response times for the upcoming year. So just a bit of information about CTAS and what it means. It's, it's really a triage or acuity scale and it really talks about the severity of illness of the patient, how sick they are. So the, the lower the number, CTAS-1, is our sickest of all patients, and we would call that a resuscitation. We'd see these in major traumas, people in active seizure, cardiac arrest, um, um, people that are severely hypotensive or people we have to ventilate. Our CTAS-2 is emergency care, so this could be somebody that's having a heart attack, a stroke, 
a head injury. A CTAS-3, which is urgent care, uh, they could have a, like a moderate breathing problem, anxiety, agitation, maybe just unwell for the last few days, but relatively stable. A CTAS-4 is a less urgent care, and this could be somebody with like with stitches or a sprained ankle. And then uh, the, the last one being a non-urgent could be like a, like a dressing change, sore throat, you know, transfer and those type of things. So it, what it does is prioritize these patients. The paramedics assess them, the patient's CTAS on their arrival. And that's what the response time is determined on is the, is the CTAS that's determined at that time. But we also assess what condition the patient is in when we transport and then also arrival on hospital. So we can measure the difference that it's been made or, or not made throughout the, the, the course of the call. So this uh, chart here will, gives you the results of our response time for 2021. And it also talks about our targets. So the first one with sudden cardiac arrest, the ministry determines that you have to measure how often you get there within six minutes. And the, and the municipality, based upon historical uh, values, but when we developed this back in 2012, it was set at 40%. And uh, for 2021, it was 50.57%, and the average was uh, 45.69. For a CTAS-1, and this is the ambulance paramedic response, the ministry sets the, the mark of eight minutes, and we set the percentile at 60%. And uh, for 2021, it was 60.82, and our five-year average is 64.9. The CTAS-2 uh, response is, and this is where we set the uh, time of 15 minutes and 90%. Uh, we set both of those. Our 2021 20, uh, result was 88.77, and our five-year average has been 89.21. Uh, th this is one area, this CTAS-2 is where we have had trouble in the past meeting this target. We've been in, in this range of just a percent to a percent off. Uh, last year in 2020, we met all targets, but the previous years, we hadn't met in some of those areas, but that's an area we continue to work on. CTAS-3 uh, in 20 minutes, 90% of the time, uh, 2021 was 97.5, and uh, the five years, 97%. CTAS-4 in 20 minutes, 90% of the time, 95 and 96 for the average. And then uh, CTAS-5 is for 20 minutes is 94.4 and 95.6. So fairly consistent over the past five years with some improvements and they sometimes they fluctuate up and down, but uh, that, that's where the kind of the response times have been over the last five years. So for the 2021 year, uh, we met all targets other than the CTAS-2, like you've seen there, we're just shy of that. One thing I like to do also is uh, these response times were developed back in 2012. And uh, we've been measuring response times uh, really since 1996. And we have a, uh, another way of measuring response times is, uh, is what we, we bundle up all the code fours and we take the 90th percentile. And that's where we really get the 90th percentile. We'd like to be able to maintain that because we really are able to tell people nine times out of 10, this is when, how long it takes us to get to a call on a code four emergency basis. So for, for 2021, when you bundle all the calls up into one, uh, it's for, they're 15 minutes and 29 seconds. And that, and that at times, we had a lot less code fours uh, when the county just assumed the service way back in 2004, it was as high as 17 minutes. So even with significant increases in response to fair calls, we've been able to reduce the response times. And our average response, and that's what I'd like to put this up there because a nine times out of 10, if there's 10,000 code fours, they only take one time. That's the, the time of the call and the 9,000th call. So you know, nine times out of 10, that's how long we'll be there. Where an average, you know, sometimes when people report that, it sounds a lot better, but that's really taking, you know, one minute, two minute response times. It could be a 30 minute response time. Hopefully that doesn't happen very often, but, uh, but it averages all out, but it really doesn't give you really a lot to, uh, as a target. So I like the nine, nine times out of 10, 90th percentile. And I, I guess just one thing to qualify here, this is not only just uh, the response time of drive time. This is from the time that, pager goes off inside the base and they get in the vehicle, pull outside and get the details and get going. So uh, we, we, we call that the shoot time. So it's the time and notify to the time we arrive at the scene. So uh, when you say that for the, the area of, of Gray County as vast as it is, uh, nine times out of 10, the time the pager goes off, the time we're at your location, it's 15 minutes and 29 seconds. In 2021, we uh, seen our, our, our greatest call volume yet. 
our patient volumes were uh, just over 13,300, which when you look at uh, 2020, uh, we did have a bit of a drop in the call volume. I believe probably some of the, the, the lockdowns from the pandemic probably impacted this, but we were 17% over where we were in 2020. But when you look back to 2019, uh, uh, which was our busiest year to date yet, we were roughly 12% above that. And uh, when you look back over the last five years, and even more when you stretch to six, but in the last five years, it's been a 22% uh, increase. So uh, year over year, uh, significant increases in response call volumes. And uh, we're, we're seeing this across the province. It's not just something for Gray. A lot of paramedic services are seeing uh, increase in call volumes. Uh, this year, uh, this past year, 2021, when we did the planning uh, for, for this upcoming year, we discussed about doing a comprehensive deployment review. And this is where we'll use an external agency to come in and uh, look at our current and, and present and predicted call volumes over the next 10 years, looking at patient demographics, growth, population growth, you know, aging population. Um, and, and then from there and, and look at different models of care and, and then come up with a plan, you know, what, what that means as far as, you know, enhancing the service, you know, to maintain or in, improve response times in different areas of the county and, and, and as the county as a whole. So uh, I look forward to that report and uh, uh, we'll be using, a, again, an external agency to look at this and give us guidance. And uh, I really look forward to have that direction. I, I think a lot of the stuff that we've done so far has made sense. You know, we knew what we needed to do as far as moving, moving, uh, moving shifting patterns and adding bases, but now, you know, based upon areas of the county that we still need to look at and then the increase in call volume, I, I look forward to this uh, guidance coming from uh, these external agencies, similar to what other, other paramedic services have done in the province. And I'll just take any questions. Thank you very much for that, uh, Kevin. If we could just return to the full screen, that would be helpful for me. I see we have one hand up already. Before we take the questions, I have to tell you, in the town of Hanover, there are two uh, sort of services that I received probably the most compliments about. One would be the police, but uh, the far favorite that I get the most compliments about is the library. And for Gray County, I have to tell you that the number one uh, service that I received compliments about not to suggest at all that other <laughs> departments are doing very, very well, is with respect to our paramedics. So congratulations to you for that. Um, I will turn to Councillor Milne. Thank you, Mr. Warden. And uh, thank you, Kevin, for the presentation. I always, uh, this is a very good report. I always look forward to it. My question is, as the county becomes more and more urbanized, is that going to play into where these numbers go, i.e., you know, it takes shorter time to get into a greater proportion of the population in an urban center as opposed to rural? And I guess further to that, at what point, where's the tipping point, um, whether we put more resources into getting more to get to more of our rural population in a in a uh, an appropriate time. Yeah, I, I like I, I think that uh, we you know we constantly face I always call it like an area versus volume problem, and uh, like we have built up areas, and that's where you see if our base locations are, is that uh, where those most urban areas are, but but you still have to look out for you know the the rural areas and where we have the area problems, and 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 have a reasonable response time. I think. If people know it takes you 15 minutes to drive and get a bag of milk, you know, we can't be on every corner. It probably takes 15 minutes to get an ambulance there. And again, we do our best that we can to align that. I look forward to that uh, consultant report because uh, I think that's where they'll look at and say, you know, this is an area that, you know, the call volume is not high, but if you put the vehicle here, it not just helps this area, but it could all, it'll help the overall system because it'll keep vehicles in those built up areas. Um, so it is a bit of a, it will be a, a bit of a, a, a work to do. Like I, I think about Gray County, we have eight base locations and 4,500 square kilometers. And we have, you know, on a, on a daily basis, we have nine ambulances. In Toronto, they have 625 square kilometers and have 110 ambulances. You know, their problem obviously when I was there, it still is, is volume. You know, like uh, 
what, what that whole area that they cover was 625 square kilometers. That, that's like one base area where they have 100 ambulances in that dense area where we have one vehicle. So it, it, is, uh, it is a balancing act in rural Ontario. You know, you, you, you want to, you want to, you know, you, there's, there's obviously a limit to resources, but you try to maximize them as best you can. Right. No, thank you very much for that. And, and there was no criticism intended in that question whatsoever. You guys do a tremendous job. You and your team, I get a lot of compliments as well. And uh, you're, you're well appreciated right across the county. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can I just to add uh, that. No, go ahead, uh, Kevin. Yeah, it's, it, it's really the paramedics and the staff and the service that really did do that. And I really got to give them the credit. Sounds like a great leader indeed. Uh, Councillor Bordignon. Thank you, Mr. Warden, through you. Uh, thanks, Kevin, for the report. As you move, I, I look forward to the, the future planning as well as you go forward. It's tough because we, you not only have the growth, you know, as we saw at Blue Mountains is the, you know, part, part of Great County is the second largest growing town in, in Canada right now, but we also have the influx of more people with COVID. So you have to sort of factor that in as well. We, we see it, you know, in our town, we saw from a 50-50 population to probably a 75-25. So I I anticipate that puts more pressure on you as a, as a, as a first responder core service. So when you, I guess when you look at this, this new plan on a go forward basis, unfortunately we'll have to factor in, um, not unfortunately, I guess, but people that are making maybe more seasonal dwellings, um, even though it's, you know, throughout the great County as becoming full-time residents. So I, I guess that will have to be part of the, the process as you move forward. That's, that's been a factor that hasn't really been in play before because we just look at the population. We look at, um, the number of houses, but here um, we see, you know, as we, with Great County Garbage Collection, with any of our services, we see the increase has probably gone up in ours, you know, like I said, from a 50-50 to a 75-25, and I anticipate that other towns throughout the municipality and the region and the county will do the same. So I guess that'll be part of the process as you move forward with the consultant's report. Yeah, like I, I think that one, one thing we'll look at is like probably high volume users, and, and we know you know, obviously, as you get older, you know, those those resources are going to be strained more. So hopefully they'll be able to look at some of that demographic material. Um, like, like COVID in the community, we have faced that, but uh, like, it's not as if like everybody with COVID is call, calling an ambulance. We've had a number of people, but it hasn't really spiked in that area. It may have some to do with it, but uh, I just think we're seeing overall increases across the board. Thank you. Just to follow up, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, no, I, I get that. I'm not saying because of COVID. I'm saying, but just more people are here for a longer period of time. Um, you know, their seasonal dwellings may have become full-time dwellings and that puts more pressure on you as a service, um, most definitely. And I just, I just, as we're looking at each report at a town level, we're looking at seeing um, how many more people are here than normally are here. If somebody's normally here, you know, 365 days and the part or seasonals are here, you know, 180 days, that's becoming more blended 275 days. So I, I, I'm sure that puts more pressure on and the, the, the just not COVID itself, but the pandemic by forcing more people into the community will put more strain on, on you as a service. Yeah. My apologies. Yeah. I see exactly what you're saying. And yes, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, with, with more people living here longer, that will increase the call volumes. We will be able to do with this report, we'll be able to break down municipalities and see increases in each individual municipality and seeing where those spikes are. So I, I really look forward to having that information. That'd be great. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Councillor Mackey. Thanks, Mr. Warden, and uh, good morning, County Council. I also just wanted to extend uh, my sincere thanks to the uh, paramedic services. Um, the response times, Kevin, is just one indicator of the great job that your service does. Uh, the paramedicine program, you know, it's really uh, reaping benefits within our, our communities. And also yesterday, I was uh, the drug and alcohol strategy uh, met yesterday, and uh, I heard about the, uh, the SOS program, the supportive outreach that uh, your service is involved with. And I was just wondering if you could maybe just highlight for County Council uh, your involvement there, because I heard, you know, you've reached over 80 people that likely otherwise wouldn't have received the support. So if you could just uh, maybe tell us about that program, please. Yeah, this is uh, like, there's been a lot of challenging things through the pandemic. And, uh, but really what it's, it's done for us is uh, been able to bring a, like a collaborative approach of lots of disciplines coming together 
to to help people in the community that have been you know marginalized by the pandemic and, and obviously they even before that as well and uh, uh, we've done the work that you know through through a recent outbreak in, in Hanover we uh, got together to support people in the community and really what we're doing is uh, to meet people where they're at so between healthcare providers and uh, and, and non governmental organizations and county staff around housing and social supports and uh, what we are doing is uh, each uh, week we either are in Hanover or Owen Sound in a market format, reaching out to people and uh, you know providing care where they're at. And then most recently in uh, January, um, we've been uh, we were approved for some <clears throat> short-term funding to deliver care within the community on an individual and a follow-up basis. Uh, so what we have is uh, partnerships with uh, Gray Bridge Health Services, uh, CMHA, the County of Gray and uh, um, United Way uh, working through our OHT um, to be able to be out there and uh, uh, seeing people. And uh, yeah, when you start this, you don't really know for sure like what, you know, the need, well, we know what the need is, but really uh, are we gonna be able to, to reach the people? And uh, we, I look forward to this report. I see stats come in on a regular basis and uh, uh, we are reaching people, a number of them and, and delivering care right where they're at. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to the uh, outcomes of this program. Thank you. Uh, keep up the good work. Uh, you know, it's amazing the, the work that you're doing that uh, is outside of some of the traditional uh, responses that we see from an ambulance service. So appreciate it. Thank you, Councillor Maki. Uh, Madam CAO, I apologize, Councillor Robinson, but I see the CAO. Did you want to comment on something that came up? If I may, yes. I just wanted to um, let Council know our plan um, was to bring a, a more fulsome report about the outreach program to the new um, mental health and addictions task force. So there will be an opportunity to discuss um, the current status of that program as well as um, you know what we can see as far as a future for it. So we will have more conversations and more information about that. So thanks. Thank you, Madam CAO. Councillor Robinson, you're next. Uh, thank you, Mr. Warden, and through you, uh, Kevin, I just want to take this opportunity to just congratulate you and commend you and, and Great County Paramedic Service for absolutely everything you do, especially during uh, the global pandemic. Uh, certainly all the outreach to our Great County residents is very, very much appreciated. So uh, thank you for all, all your hard work. My question is in terms of response time. Uh, I wonder if you could just uh, explain the definition of response time and how it factors into once you're at the call and if it uh, takes on um, more uh, response or it, the call may take a, a different turn in, in, uh, in terms of needing further assistance. How do you collect that data to identify not only the time it takes to get to either a rural or um, an urban residence, but also the care that the individual takes once you get there in terms of time frame. Thank you. Um, well, yeah, like as far as like, so when we arrive, uh, we measure the CTAS, like, so where they're at. So if we, like, for instance, if we were to go to an opioid overdose, uh, we, we would arrive and there's, there's a good possibility they would be what we call respiratory arrest and we'd have to ventilate the patient. They'd be a CTAS one. With the treatment that we give them, by the time we were able to transport, uh, that person may be a CTAS three, you know, probably not much higher than that, but most likely two or a three, because the, the medications that we gave them, uh, you know, have reversed the opioid overdose and we we're able to transport them to the hospital. So our, our goal is when we arrive is to, to treat the patient, you know, that like to the best of our abilities based upon the protocols and the directives that we have. Um, and we, we constantly look at that treatment that's provided uh, by ourselves and also our base hospital system. Every call is audited, you know, as far as uh, anytime there's what we call an advanced life support directive. So a medication given or some type of defibrillation. So they are all audited. Um, we also, as far as time on calls and stuff like that, like for instance, a stroke, you know, we don't take you to the local hospital. Uh, we take you to one sound, regardless of the time frame. Uh, so at one time it used to be only within like a four and a half hour window, but, but now it's in any time frame to where you receive that stroke care right away for your cell services. So yeah, there's just a different myriad of, uh, 
um, uh, you know, treatments and care and transport. We have a dashboard that we monitor daily, like in, at all times, it's real time. And uh, we're able to see, you know, the last 24 hours of call volumes and where we've had peaks and, uh, and where we've had, you know, obviously areas where we have less availability of units. So that's something we use that dashboard on a daily basis. We can see every hospital, how many patients they've got in the last four hours, how many offload delays have been. So that using that technology really helps us. I don't know if that, does that answer your question or? Yes, uh, thank you very, very much for, for the detailed response. Appreciate it. Yes, and Kevin, I wonder if you might also explain, I know when I had the opportunity to have a tour with you, um, uh, you explained and showed me actually in a visual how when there's a response, what the other team members are doing. So as one person is responding, what are the others uh, doing? You know, how they, they sort of covered a gap now that's created by that uh, response. Would you talk a bit about that? Yeah, we, we call those standbys. And uh, like, uh, like for me, when I think about my ops on the road job, uh, like we really what I was always concerned with was what we still have available. Not, not that I don't care about what the call is happening, but I need to ensure that for the next call that hasn't happened yet and is going to happen in the future to make sure that we mitigate any type of extended response time. So what we do is, uh, for example, between Meaford and Craig Leith, if Meaford was out on a call uh, and uh, Craig Leith would come over and cover at Thornberry. But if we have an additional unit, like we have an, an extra first response unit in Markdale and an extra unit in Nolan Sound, is that we would actually send that unit over and then we would fill that actual urban area. So every day, and, and, and it's a little bit easier when there's only one call, but uh, there's lots of times where we have five calls at once, and uh, then you have to kind of split the difference across the whole county of Gray. So we, we work with our dispatch center through a, what we call an emergency coverage statement, and we have uh, standby locations, and it's, it's the constant uh, discussion between dispatch and our supervisor about what we call it maintaining balanced emergency coverage. Very good. Thank you for that. Councillor Woodbury, I saw your head bobbing a lot, I guess, given your background as a fire, firefighter. Um, this all makes a lot of sense to you, doesn't it? It sure does. And and there's so many factors. Um, uh, and Kevin and you and your team are just doing a fantastic job of this. Um, <clears throat> but as, as different populations move in, there's different problems. If different uh, as people age there's different problems and and uh, construction everything can can get into it and uh, these moves up move ups as we used to call them in, in the fire service uh, are so important because um, the response times can just be terrible once incidents start happening and uh, and I can't stress like we've got a service here uh, that you lead Kevin that's second to none um, so um, yeah, great job. Thank you for that. Okay, I see no other hands. Good discussion, good report. Thank you very much. It's time to call the question on the motion to receive the report and to send the performance results uh, to the Ministry of Health. Is there anyone opposed to that? I'm seeing no hands. That is carried. Thank you very much, Kevin. Okay, we're on now, moving on to the land of West Gray, talking about Gray Road 27 reconstruction project. Uh, I think that that puts Pat on deck. This item has been moved by Councillor Desai and seconded by Councillor Carlton. Pat, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Uh, yeah, this is a report to, uh, to get permission to uh, tender Gray Road 27, which is Durham Road West uh, in Durham in 2022. So a consultant has been working for West Gray and they've been trying to expedite the design um, to get it completed. And it's very close to completion. We've been given preliminary drawings already. So basically West Gray needs to do these upgrades to uh, Gray Road 27 to service future development north of 27. So it consists of urbanizing the entire 450 meters of road, full sanitary storm, water main upgrades. And it would be one lift of hot mix in 2022 and a second lift in 2023. So the job wasn't included in the 22 budget um, but uh, like I said, West Gray is kind of moving it up. They're uh, trying to get it done this year. And it's uh, on, uh, from our point of view, it's 76% of it is funded through development charges. So it's a relatively easy move up for us. Um, and uh, we also include in the report, the latest estimate in the, from the 10 year plan, which was in May. Uh, the prices, uh, the latest cost estimate was cheaper than that. 
Um, but of course, this year we've seen um, higher prices in our tenders so far, uh, especially with underground work and pipe. So we'll see. We added some uh, buffer, our consultant, or West Gray's consultant added a buffer, uh, and we're fairly comfortable that um, the prices are okay, at least with our work, especially. Um, the road is recommended to be closed, and West Gray's targeting a tender and an October completion. And we'll be bringing back another report um, in or later for uh, the tender award. Thank you. Are there any questions, Councillor Sawber? Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Warden. And I'm glad that uh, 76 is percent is coming from the development charges. However, I'll note that the um, in the 10 year capital plan at that point, 66% was coming from development charges and that's now gone up by 10%. I think that's a good good news story for our taxpayers, but I'm just wondering how, how that's possible to change the percentage um, of the part to be paid by development charges. Have we changed the assumption on uh, you know, existing benefiting? Uh, through you, Mr. Warden, I know we have made some changes because of the new development charge bylaw, um, but uh, as far as the, the, the specifics of it, I, I think finance would, I could get that question, that answer for you um, more specifically. Thank you. All right. Councillor Robinson, you are next. Thank you, Mr. Warden. And I, I just want to say thank you to uh, Pat and uh, his staff for bringing this uh, report forward. It, it, the project really has been expedited due to an increased development activity in West Gray. And I really appreciate uh, uh, Pat and his staff working with West Gray uh, staff to address the time frame uh, in a very positive way. So thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that. I don't see any other hands, so perhaps it's time to call the question on the motion before us. Is there anyone opposed? Seeing no hands, I'll say that that is carried. We move on to item D, sticking with Wes Gray. We're now talking about the structure 9-354 replacement. That puts Pat again on deck. This item has been moved by Councillor Burley and seconded by Councillor Mackey. Pat, over to you. Okay, yeah, this is uh, uh, the um, award of uh, structure 9-354 and Greer 9. You'll see the map on page 17 uh, for where it is. So it was built in 1940. Um, it's our lowest, uh, uh, one of our lowest indexes in the county at 14.45 out of 100. Um, originally, we had scheduled it for 2021. Uh, we only had one bid. Um, for a variety of reasons, we decided to delay it till 2022, put the project back in the budget. And now we've had four bids come in, uh, which we're very happy with. Uh, a lot of the um, items in here are lump sum. So uh, they're kind of, you know, it, it was up to the contractors to figure out what this, some of this stuff is going to cost. So we're not expecting huge overruns because, you know, we're not necessarily measuring every item that goes in. So we, we felt comfortable with a smaller contingency of 2%. Uh, the project is still over budget uh, by $291,000. Now we've had some other projects that have come in since that haven't come to this committee yet that are kind of covering that off. Uh, but uh, as per this report, we're gonna cover the, um, the deficit through other surpluses or failing that the Canada Community Building Fund Reserve, which was formerly gas tax. So we're recommending the award to Rubos Farm Service. They did a culvert for us last year and they've done a lot of work for us uh, over the years. So we're very comfortable with, um, with the quality work that they provided us. Thank you. Any questions, Council? Seeing no hands, we'll call the question on the motion before us to receive this report, um, the tender results, and uh, to award the tender and to fund the project deficit. Anyone opposed? And that is carried. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, moving on to item 4E. Um, dealing with the Mental Health and Addictions Task Force Terms of Reference uh, that will put Tara on uh, deck. This item has been moved by Councillor Body and seconded by Councillor Burley. Tara, over to you. Thank you, Mr. Warden. This report is before you today as a result of direction to staff to bring forward terms of reference for a Mental Health and Addictions Task Force. There's a growing sense of urgency to address the mental health and substance use concerns across Gray County. 
Tara, well, factors. I'm you. Tara, I'm going to interrupt yeah. you. I apologize. For me, anyways, your sound is a little bit sort of wavy, so it floats in and out. Uh, okay. Others may be finding that. If you could come a little closer to the mic, it may help. Go ahead and test again and see if we... Is ready. that better? Yes, it is better, actually. Okay, great. Sorry about that. I will start from the beginning. This report is before you today as a result of direction to staff to bring forward terms of reference for a mental health and addictions task force. There's a growing sense of urgency to address the mental health and substance use concerns across Gray County. As well, factors that contribute to mental health and substance use have been amplified by the pandemic. The task force will examine the current system of treatment and support that exists for those suffering from mental health and substance, <coughs> substance use disorders. It will create a local response that identifies priorities to help in the development of mental health supports and harm reduction strategies. The terms of reference propose that the committee consists of the following members. Phil Dodd from Keystone Child, Family and Youth Services, Clark McFarland from CMHA, Naomi Vauden from Grey Bruce Health Services, and a member of the Peer Advisory Network from the Community Drug and Alcohol Strategy, who will be confirmed at a later date following further discussion at the task force table, as well as a member of Grey Bruce Public Health Unit. Um, and since the time that the agenda has been published, it has been confirmed that Dr. Era is able to fill that role. The terms of reference as drafted and the motion before you recommend that five county councillors plus the warden also sit on the task force. However, expressions of interest were received from seven councillors. Um, staff are asking you today if council wishes to expand the political representation to seven councillors and appoint all of those who have expressed an interest in sitting on the task force. Councillors O'Leary, Burley, Keaveny, Columbus, Mackey, and Hutchinson, as well as Councillor Carlton, are all interested in the appointment. Should County Council was wish to consider an increased membership, a motion to amend the pending motion to reflect that change would be in order. You'll also notice that the recommendation proposes for the task for, excuse me, the, for the task force to meet prior to County Council's adoption of today's minutes. So staff are looking at dates for that first meeting for the group and we'll confirm that um, following today's meeting. So Barb and Kim and I are able to answer any questions that Council may have. Thank you very much, Tara. Madam CAO, is there anything that you want to add to the um... I don't know if it's a recommendation, but the suggestion that we um, change the uh, county councillor membership from five to seven. Uh, thank you, you, you uh, Mr. Warden. No, I, I think that um, given the strong interest of this and the and the the wide scope of of topics that we might be covering here, I think it's um, it's a good idea to let everybody who wants to be um, part of the conversations to be at the table especially when we're doing so much virtually right now. That's not very good. Uh, so with that said, it might be then appropriate, I see your hand, uh, Councillor Swever, and I'll come right to you, but it might be uh, appropriate for someone, Tara, uh, to make a motion um, that we at least put on the table uh, the change from five to seven. Um, so do we wanna deal with that first before we have questions or Tara, should we be dealing with the questions first? Um, you could probably do either, either way, but um, maybe, maybe we'll um, speak to the questions first and then go from there. Oh, very good, Councillor Soever, you're on. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Warden. And um, so last meeting when we we talked about the entertain the motion to form this committee, I expressed a concern that you know this committee work with the community safety and well being plan. And um, I don't see any reference to the community safety and well-being plan in the terms of reference. So I'm just wondering, did we consult with the coordinator of the community safety and well-being plan? Or uh, because as I understand, they've got an addiction and substance abuse um, table um, working group put together already. So I'm just wondering if we consulted with the uh, and how this is going to be coordinated with the community safety and well-being plan, because, um, you know, I certainly we don't want us to be seen to be turning our back on the community safety and well-being plan and 
which we did with uh, Bruce County in concert and, um, <laughs> and, you know, going and doing our own thing outside of that. Uh, I see Barb's hand up, Barb. Thank you for the question um, through you, Mr. Warden. Um, that's a great question. And we certainly are not doing it in isolation. Uh, I sit at the steering committee for both the community drug and alcohol strategy, as well as the community safety and well-being, and in addition to the poverty task force. So we see all of these tables as being intrinsic to this work. And there are certainly definitely um, direct connections and uh, no duplication is, is uh, intended. And I think the direct line having um, myself at that table, as well as Anne-Marie uh, at many of these same tables, we'll be able to ensure that the work is actually uh, leveraging one another and we're levers to one another's uh, goals. So uh, thank you for that though. Thank you, Councillor Swever, anything else? Yes, thank you for, for that answer. And I would hope that we would uh, make that known to the, uh, the, the leadership of the Community Safety and Wellbeing yeah. Plan as, um, they, they might be a little bit um, feeling left out of this um, process. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, next is Councillor Mackey. Thanks, Mr. Warden. Um, I guess my question uh, is for Kim. Uh, and it's just in regards, Kim, there have been uh, some uh, valuable members of the, the community that have reached out in regards to um, <laughs> wanting to participate uh, do you envision the uh, the task force being able to invite those individuals to speak specifically on certain topics? Do you, Mr. Warden, and uh, thanks for that, uh, Councillor Mackey. Yes, I think one of the uh, first orders of business for the task force will be to discuss a work plan. And as we've indicated here, the intent, um, given where we are um, with the with the council cycle, is that we want to have monthly meetings. And we want this to be a, a very focused uh, group of discussions over the next few months. So if we put together a work plan um, with uh, everybody's input into the topics that we think will help us put together the best recommendations, then we can invite um, the various people who have indicated that they did wish to speak and, and had information that they felt was important for the task force to consider. So we'll try and, and, and work our way through that and have a good initial discussion. Make sure that we get those people to the table. Very good, Councilor Mackey. Very good. Councilor Bordignon. Uh, thank you. Um, further to Councilor Mackey, which was an excellent question. Um, we've had members of the public have reached out. So as we're putting the terms of reference together, I guess, I know it's early stages. I think it's so important based on the regionality of, of, of the region, uh, as well as the, I, I was, I was pleasantly surprised at the um, public input already wanting to help. Usually we have to go out looking for people, people coming forward, wanting to be able to part of this. So I, I just echo uh, what the previous councillor said in, re in regards to making sure we get that, that grassroots public uh, level included, because that's, um, I think that's going to be paramount as part of the success as we see, you know, from, from the administration point and the governance point, but also the sort of the grassroots boots on the ground. So I, I think that's a, a very important part that we need to put forward as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bordignon. And um, I would just say, adding to what you have said and Councillor Mackey, I've had a, a number of people uh, reach out to me expressing uh, interest in contributing uh, to this task force. So it's, uh, it's very good. We've got uh, public interest and certainly we've got uh, council interest. So I'll turn attention back to the council interest now. Is there anyone who wants to put the um, motion, at least for debate, on the floor of moving uh, with councillor uh, participation from five members to seven? Uh, councillor Burley. Are you thank, you, Mr. thank you, Mr. Warden. I would gladly make that motion. Excellent. I'm looking for a seconder, and the seconder is Councillor Hutchison. Uh, discussion now. And if there, oh, Councillor Desai. Thank you, Ward Next, um, <clears throat> I, I'm happy to see that there's this amount of uh, interest uh, to be on the committee. Uh, however, I do have a um, question with regards to um, does having seven people on the committee um, slow down the work of the committee, uh, first of all? Because we, we have noticed that it's, and sometimes it's just hard to get a time where you can get 
even five people together. So with seven people, does that get affected, slow down the work of the community and thereby uh, reduce the effect the, the committee can have uh, on, on, on what we're trying to achieve here? Um, we have other committees uh, of council where we have hard uh, limits and how many, uh, how many members of council are on that. Um, at the end of the day, yeah, one way or the other, I, I, I would like for us to reflect on, you know, what, shouldn't this be uh, similar to that? I get it that the, there's a lot of interest, but there is also significant interest for other, other committees. And we, we just go ahead and have an election for that. It's, it's nothing personal. It's just um, committees work best when they're smaller, more agile. Uh, so I, would, I just want us to reflect on that perhaps. Thank you, um, Madam Deputy Clerk. Any comments on, on that? I think there is a bit of a challenge, isn't there? The more members you have in terms of organizing a meeting? It, it can be at times, um, though I, looking ahead to possible meeting dates for the task force, um, I we're thinking that if we keep it consistent, so for example, the thought was this committee could perhaps meet the third of February, or sorry, the third um, Tuesday of every month with the exception of February, of course, at the same time. And I don't think those dates conflict with any local meetings. So I, th I think there is a little bit concern that there might be some conflicts down the road, but I think overall, the hope is that there wouldn't be any concern with the committees slowing down because of the increased membership. Very good, Madam CAO. I saw your hand up, but are you <laughs> satisfied okay. with the answer given by Tara? No, that's good. We we did have a conversation about how best to do this, given that the, the, there's a, a fair number of, of folks who want or need to be at the table, including people like um, Alison Govier from um, Mental Health and Addictions Peace and Darren Clock from our paramedics. So we are coordinating a large number of people to participate in this. I think um, hopefully people do see this as a priority and we understand best efforts and, um, and we'll help. If somebody needs to miss a meeting, we'll make sure that we get them caught up. Right. As long as we can get quorum. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Keegan, you're next. Thank you, Mr. Ward, and I was just going to add as the president that I think council will remember the Economic Development Committee and, and more members of council came forward and, and wanted to uh, participate in that committee and council agreed at that time to uh, to um, allow everyone who wanted to uh, be involved in that committee to uh, be a member and I'm hoping that the same will happen here because the work is so important and I think all of us who put our names forward recognize that this is as has been stated, a priority, and that we will clear our schedules to make sure we can attend those meetings. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Hutchison, you're next. Thank you, uh, Warden Hicks. I was just uh, sitting here looking at our council schedule when it appears that uh, I do land on the third Tuesday quite often with West Gray's uh, council. So some are at 6 p.m. or whatnot, but, uh, you know, again, there's more than enough on there, so I will certainly attend wherever I can. Thank you. The staff will work the best we can with all the members to make sure it works for as many people as we can get. Yeah, Tara, we need you right up close to the mic. <clears throat> Sorry. And the staff will work the best we can with all members to make sure that as many people can attend those meetings as possible. Thank you. I do not see any other hands. So with that said, perhaps it's time to call the question on the motion before us to move the council participation from uh, five members to seven. Uh, is there anyone opposed to that motion? I do not see any hands. So with that said, it is carried. We're on now to the main uh, motion, I suppose as amended. Uh, are we ready to call the question there or is there any further uh, discussion to be had? So no hands, I will call the question on the main motion. Is there anyone opposed? that motion. No hand showing, that too is carried. Thank you very much. It looks like this will be a very uh, active uh, task force. All right, we are on to uh, adjournment now, I believe. Let me just note, uh, on to other business.
Item number five, is there any other business? I don't think that there's any. And number six is any notices of motion. And there are no hands. So that does take us to adjournment. Um, Sorry, Mr. Warden. Um, I, oh, I do see Councillor um, Desai. Yes, I see him now as well. Councillor Desai, go right ahead. Thank you, Warden Hicks. It's not a notice of motion. It's more of a uh, other business item, I guess. Uh, I know following the last meeting, uh, the CAO had sent out an email with regards to um, meeting in person. Um, I'm just wondering if uh, we should expect an email or if the CAO has uh, somewhat of an update uh, at this point, uh, or if we should, if I should just let it move to adjournment and wait for the email. Madam Deputy Clerk, did you want to weigh in there? I will, I think Kim has something she can add to that. Um, thanks so much uh, for the question. Thanks everybody for uh, your willingness to uh, continue to work to meet virtually one more time. We are, we are looking at moving back into the, the hybrid model for our next meeting. So certainly, um, We'll be watching carefully what the province's direction is, if there are any changes or anything with regard to um, capacity limits or that might impact our meetings. But the uh, idea is to, at our next meeting, allow people to then return to chambers. So we'll, we will send out an email and just confirm everything um, after the province's next update shortly. Thank you, Madam CEO. Mary Lou, you have your hand up. Thank you, Mr. Warden. I was just going to respond to Councillor Sewever's question on the DC charges for Gray Road 27. The new DC study shows that 76% of the project is eligible for DCs. And when you run the calculations, that matches the amount that's quoted in the report. Good. Thank you for that. Very good. Is there any other, other business? And no notices of motion. So that brings us then to adjournment. It is therefore moved by Councillor Burling, no surprise, and Councillor Hutchison uh, that we adjourn. Anyone opposed? No hands, wonderful. Thank you very much. It's now about 20 Thank past. Everyone. Bye bye. Good job. Have a good day, Thank everyone. You. Have a great day. Carol. Take care, everyone.